the way, these uh, the recordings are then available and people after our meeting tonight uh, actually access the file to take a look at the presenters um, in subsequent time. So that's that's the reason for recording it. So we'll, we'll turn the program no over to you now. All right, I first will apologize if there's two <clears throat> little kids that run through in here. My wife was detained at work late tonight and she's a veterinarian in Hampstead. So if we get disturbed by the kids, I do apologize ahead of time, but I had to run home to make sure everything was good. No need to apologize at all. Good. I am a sixth generation farmer. I've been on the same family farm. Um, I currently, we till a lot of ground. We are primarily corn, soybean, hay. We run a feedlot. Can somebody mute my? Yeah, we're getting we're getting some background noise from somebody. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so what we do is primarily grow corn, suey beans, um, hay for our feedlot uh, that we furnish all the meat for basically Mount Airy Locker through one of our feedlots, as well as we grow rye. So yeah, I, I am very blessed that I am an agronomist by trade. I got to come back to the family farm and start taking over the operation in 2018. And I run the day-to-day -day operation. Since I've come aboard, we've probably increased about 450 to 500 more acres. So we're going to start with a little bit of the history of what we do. Um, being that I'm still on the same family farm for six generations, I've been very blessed. I get to work with my father. Before that, with my grandfather. My two kids are with me every day. Charlie's uh, five and Mackenzie's seven. And they're taking off in our footsteps. I really hope that they decide to do something besides agriculture, but uh, it seems like they're going to be with us in uh, one aspect of our businesses or another. In 2018, we decided to diversify because it is, it is hard to make a consistent living in agriculture where we run a consulting business. Um, I actually consult for a group of high yielding farmers around the country. And I do a lot of traveling, speaking to large groups, large organizations about what we're doing on our farming operations to increase yields and what we face on a day-to-day -day basis with the Chesapeake Bay. You know, I always start out by saying the nutrient management, we all thought in 2001 when the Water Quality Act came available was going to be the detriment to agriculture in Maryland. I like to turn it around and say, I think it made us, our, our great farmers, even better farmers, because now we've learned how to farm in a shorter window and to maximize the yields and the profits that we're doing. So this time of year, when you see a piece of agriculture equipment running around, please get out of the way because chances are we have been running since four or five in the morning all the way to dark. Tonight, speaking to your group, Nate and Ed are still out working and I got to have the evening off early. So that really also helped uh, work into my schedule as well. But being a diversified operation, I do a lot of crop consulting for high yielding guys throughout the country. As well, it has landed me onto a spot with a new TV show called Pod Fathers that is on RFD TV, where they're following myself, a gentleman, Temple Rhodes from Queen Anne's County, Maryland, a gentleman from Ohio, and two guys from Arkansas on our quest to increase our bean yields, um, which has been a, a different experience, but it also come to light when Temple and I decided to do it with Maryland. What we were really doing is thinking how we could be a different voice for Maryland agriculture. So this is a national TV show. It's uh, picked up on Discovery, YouTube, everything like that. And a lot of the guys that we're with are facing a lot of the same issues and problems of how to increase yield as you're losing acres to development. And I'll, and I'll, 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 I'll tune in on that a little bit more here as we talk about development as it pertains in Carroll County and especially the Finksburg area here in a second. The other aspect of our business is we started a seed company in 2018, and that was primarily corn and suey beans. Since then, we have brought on a um, what I call a forage expert. Nathan came aboard. He was working for Pennington Seeds. So now we large scale sell grass seed as well as hay, pasture mixes as well. But we're not trying to be everything what we are as a farmer dealer. So what does that entail? That entails where we are more relationship bound farm to farm instead of you know a retail location so a lot of people that know who what we do we're not trying to be a large operation we're just trying to diversify our operation so we're just not in the one aspect of the business 
We also added a seed treater. So one of the main things as you hear me talk around the country is I always say you got to control the controllables. Everything that is in your power to control, I try to control. So the seed business allows us to get the best seed. We can treat the seed our own way, as well as now we're controlling the controllables to maximize high yielding profits as we move forward. So I like to push the limits. We, you know, I'm a graduate of the University of Maryland. They just did an article on me. I think I think outside the box more today, being 43 years old than I did in my early 20s. And the main reason is, is because agriculture is always changing. When I was in college, there wasn't GPS. There wasn't computers. Cell phones just became the rage. I didn't really even, I learned to type on typewriters. Okay. So computers to me, guess what? I've, I love Zoom meetings now because I don't have to do the traveling, but I've been to North Dakota, all over the country giving talks. So <clears throat> as we're moving forward in the technology that's at hand, I'm even doing Zoom meetings as we're planting corn and beans throughout the year. So it's enabled me to be able to have my operation where I'm still out farming and I'm able to do a lot of talks and talk to people throughout the country as well as do my consulting a lot easier. However, <clears throat> with agriculture and technology comes a lot of other issues like solar flares. So there's times where we're planting corn then all of a sudden our tracker will veer off to the right. Or if the president decides to fly to Camp David and doesn't tell us that he's flying to Camp David, they jam the GPS signals and that messes up <laughs> corn planting. So <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of little facets in farming that everybody thinks, oh, well, he's got GPS, he can just take a nap. You better be on your uh, paying attention and seeing everything going on. However, with the technologies of GPS, I sit on the local soil conservation board, which is a very dear thing to me, water and soil conservation beings I'm a farmer. So we variable rate all of our fertilizers. We variable rate all of our limes. So everybody says to me, so like on your hills, I guess you're putting down twice as much. Actually, no, what we do is we're looking at our soils that are higher producing yields. So that would be your bottoms, your, what I like to call your manor type soils. And we're actually fertilizing those more than the tops of the ridges. And the reason being is the top of the ridges They've been over fertilized for years and they're not your high producing, but we're, we're pulling the 300 bushel corn yields off and 100 bushel bean yields is in the your better soils and you better be fertilizing those. So with technology, we're able to do various mapping, which one field, let's say is a 15 acre field, we're probably pulling anywhere between 12 to 25 soil samples out of that field. So that way we're better utilizing our fertilizer utilization. So we're able to fertilize lime and actually throughout the years, we've cut down our use of fertilizer and our use of lime. So we're able to put it where it's needed and we're not wasting <clears throat> you know, resources or money in our case uh, to achieve the higher yields. The other things in our operation that we're looking at is the rye. So I actually in 2019 or 18, I started um, growing a hybridized rye and in 2019, I became one of two farmers that are growing all the rye now for Sagamore rye whiskey. So if you drink a bottle of Sagamore rye, all that rye is grown between here and Dayton, Maryland. Uh, myself and Ricky Bauer are the two farmers that produce the rye for Sagamore rye whiskey. In 2021, um, if you guys all heard, Kevin Plank has decided to get out of the horse business and Sagamore Farms. We will now be farming that with Sagamore Industries, and that will be non-GMO corn being grown for their whiskey business. Mm. So that was a very well diversified avenue that has actually taken our operation a little different turn, and we're now growing corn and rye for other distilleries. In Carroll County, there's miscellaneous distillery in Mount Airy, as well as we, and I, and I hate that I can't remember this one's name, but there's another one in Baltimore that we're providing all the corn to. So the cool thing for me is, you know, in agriculture, <clears throat> you get to hear suey oil, suey diesel, uh, ethanol, all these things that you're making the crop, but you never see the end product. So with dealing with the distilleries, we provide the corn or we provide the rye. They turn it into whiskey, which we get to see the end product of that through their 
uh, bourbon or whiskey or whatever they're making at the time. However, they're returning the grain back to us in a mash. And now we're being able to utilize that back in our feedlot and we're feeding that back to the cattle. So there's nothing going to waste in this operation. So as we're moving forward, I am looking more and more into this kind of operation because we're now being able to see the full circle, what we're doing, what we're producing, and we can control the controllables, as I like to always say. And we're actually seeing the end product of what we're doing. So it's a little different operation. <clears throat> when we first did it, my father thought I was crazy. Uh, now that it's 2021, I'm looking forward uh, to him being able to come back to manage it a little bit better for me because I am stretched really thin and hoping that it'll grow. We are looking at putting a stone grinder in so we can start stone grinding the grains for the distilleries before it goes because it's a certain flavor, texture that these guys are looking for and the stone mill handles that. So I said earlier, we'd get back to how is agriculture faced in Finksburg? And the largest challenge in Finksburg is development. And as we all know, there's housing developments going up all over, or, you know, the family farm gets passed down or the mom and dad pass away and the next generation doesn't know what to do because they have a job off the farm and they want to sell it. And that is probably one of the toughest things that I'm faced with being 43 in agriculture, that there's not a lot of young farmers. Most of my friends are 70 and 80 years old. Um, I'm very blessed. You know, my father is with me all the time. Tom is with us. He's 72. And I'm very well mentored by an 89-year-old guy who will be planting his own corn this year named Donald. And, you know, that's what means a lot to me. So Which as we're great. moving forward, yeah, um, he's remarkable. So, you know, there's not a lot of young farmers out there to be talking with. Or if they are, everybody wants to farm the world. I don't. We're, we're producing higher yields and we're looking. However, development's our number one largest issue that I'm, we're faced with because of the price of land, because of now the property values. If you guys haven't been following the real estate market, what's a house sit on the market? 24, 48 hours, and most of them go into a price where it's worth more now than what you were asking for. So, you know, this has always been the farmer's challenge, but remember, that's one resource we can never get back. Once it's a housing development, it's a housing development, and you can never have it back. So, you know, one of the things that are near and dear to me is ag land preservation, and I feel that that is one of the best resources we need to be pushing and promoting because I know everybody wants to move here, have the farm land behind them. Um, I call it the NIMBY approach. It's great, but not in my backyard once you move here. However, we need to kind of have what I consider that, that smart growth development. And we're kind of pushing some of our limits in certain areas in the Finksburg Hampstead region, I feel in my own opinion, that we need to be watching and preserving more farmland and giving options to other guys. I mean, for a young guy, if he wanted to start farming equipment, a corn planter, that's 50 to 70,000. Sprayers, 50 to 70,000. I mean, it's a, it takes a lot of money to get into agriculture. It's not something that's very cheap. You know, I, I've had a lot of people call that when the pandemic happened and, oh, we bought three steers because we wanted to butcher them. Now we can't get them into a butcher shop and we don't know how to haul them. We don't know what to do. They came here weighing 50 to 80 pounds, and now they're 1,000 pounds. What happens? Well, of course it's going to grow. Yeah. But these are the things most people don't pay attention to. They go into a feed store, they fed it, they did what they were supposed to, and now they have no clue. So, you know, COVID has a lot of people calling us, can you haul this? No, we don't do that kind of work. But, you know, it's kind of funny to hear we're going to, we're, we're farmers and we have two acres and here's what we're doing and we need your help. And we're like, our equipment's way too big to do anything for you. And I, I'm not trying to be rude, but at the same time, you know, it is where we're heading, I think in a future, you know, I, I talked to variable produce farmers and they've had some of the best years they've had in the, during the pandemic. Us on the other hand, the grain market's been very volatile. That's why we're diversifying with the distilleries a little differently. COVID was rough, 
from the distillery standpoint, because we were only selling corn to make hand sanitizer, our rye wasn't being produced because uh, state mandate, all distilleries were making hand sanitizer during that time. So we were just selling incremental amounts of corn where they had contracted with us with larger amounts and they had to back out. So COVID for most farmers was a rough time. I mean, grain farmers, I should say, because of the fact that a lot of our contracts, we had to be negotiable with these operations because they were having to be state mandated not to produce whiskey to make hand sanitizer for the general public. Mm. So, you know, as we're looking at different operations, being a sixth generation farmer, 43 years old, two young kids coming along the way, I can tell you, I've seen a lot of changes in my 43 years. I know my father has in his 70 years of living around here. And it, it, my grandfather lived to be 96 years old and I was very blessed to ride around with him a lot growing up. That is why I'm not like my father. I'm more like my grandfather. Um, and everybody will tell you that. Um, so as I say this, you know, I listen to my grandfather saying, oh, that was so-and-so's farm when that got developed. Now I'm listening to my father go, oh yeah, I remember when that farm was there and it's getting developed. You know, I drive up and down the road now and I'm looking and I'm watching farms get developed. So one of the facets for me is as much promoting, as much um, emphasis as we can is, and I don't know if your group helps with this or, or not, but anything we can do to promote ag land preservation is a, is a really big uh, dear to my heart campaign that I wanna make sure everybody's aware of to make sure that the commissioners and the governor mm -hmm. always is aware of preservation and the, and the dire need of funding ag land preservation. Um, we've been blessed. We bought a couple farms throughout the last several years and they are all preserved farms. Um, my goal is to always leave a farm for one of my kids if they choose to or not, you know, but at the same token, you drive up and down the road certain days of the week with a piece of machinery and you get passed and told you're number one. You know, I don't remember that when I was 14 years old. You know, I've been driving tractors since I was eight, nine, farming with my dad and grandfather. And today it's the attitude of the people. You know, we're all in a hurry to go nowhere. You know, you're in my way. You need to get out of my way. Why are you out there right now? So, you know, as we're moving forward, that's one of those things that we need to be making sure that we are cognizant of the equipment, the long hours that we're putting in throughout this time of year. So... Just some random things. I know Farm Beer is working very closely with several other organizations right now to be making sure we're promoting, you know, that farm equipment's out there, farmers are tired, you know, let's all share the road and be safe together. So I hope this helps your organization. If there's any questions, please let me know. Oh, it, it helps tremendously. Thank you. It, it's, uh, it's always interesting to get the professional's perspective on their craft. And whenever you don't deal with it on a daily basis, you, you just don't have the understanding of all the challenges that you face for sure. Chris, the, uh, the acreage that is uh, owned by, I guess it's owned by the county in agricultural preservation, that's dedicated to farming. So f farmers can farm the, the land owned by the county, is that correct? Mm -mm. No, so ag land preservation is preserved farmland where the farmer gives up their development rights to the farm. So we sell off our development rights. Oh, okay, that's right. And that's right. Yeah. You, you have two different, you have two different, you, either you're in a rural legacy program, mm -hmm. which is a county held easement, or you're in the mouth, which is a state held easement. Mm -hmm. But essentially what you're doing is you're getting paid to never be able to develop your farm is, is how ag land preservation works. So, you know, we bought one that was designated R40 and we sold all of our development rights to that operation. Okay. But as part of the requirement, then are you obligated to farm the land or can it just set there? So you, you have to meet certain criteria. You have to have a forest conservation plan. You have to have a soil conservation plan. It does not, I mean, it could be in pasture. It could be a tree farm. It could be um, a vegetable operation. As long as it's an agriculture entity, I mean, it could be enrolled in a program like CRP, which is a federal program that um, takes care of just wildlife. So there's different avenues. It wouldn't just have to be a farm that's farmed. It could be in different operations of agriculture. Okay. The uh, I was not aware of um, 
Kevin Plank getting out of the horse business and actually converting, I guess, a lot of property, a lot of acreage then to farming. How many acres will you be farming there? I believe it's right around three, 250 acres that'll be coming out of pasture. He's not getting 100% out of the horse business, but a lot of the paddocks are coming out. It was a big uproar in about, I want to say November. Um, I was having to field a lot of questions and he had me on there saying why we're doing this. But, you know, COVID hits, the horse industry wasn't what he thought it was going to be at the time. And it, it was just a personal thing. The Sagamore distillery started really taking off and, you know, they pride themselves on their craftsmanship and the quality of their, their whiskey. And it really is, he's bringing what I like about the program is, or the being part of his operation with the program is the fact that the water is actually coming out of the old springs at Sagamore distillery yep. or Sagamore farms, yeah. excuse me, yeah. going down to the distillery, mm -hmm. but rye whiskey was a very prevalent whiskey for the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And if you ever go down to his facility there in Port Covington, he actually has a, a map up of where all of the old rye distilleries were um, throughout the state of Maryland, which is really cool. And he tells the whole history about rye whiskey. Yeah. And this was something near and dear. He wanted to bring something back with Maryland agriculture. That's why it's Maryland corn and Maryland rye in what he's producing. Very good. How many total acres are you farming? I believe we're somewhere right around 800 or so. Really? <laughs> that, that's a lot of acreage to cover. <laughs> so, well, now that I have dad that's in politics, I lose him a good bit. So I, I, I lose my right hand man a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I understand. A question? So Chris, yeah. Chris, yeah. This, this, is, um, this is Sissy Altstadt. And uh, oh, yeah. it was really, it's really. I mean, I, I feel like I learned a lot from you already. And I would, you know, I hope that other people will, that will broadcast this, uh, the recording of this meeting. Because, you know, it's, even for me, I mean, I'm, I live on a farm, I've got a preserved farm, you know, I, I coordinate with, with Dave Browning a lot. But even so, I don't have a sense of the, of, of the cycle or the economics. And what, I, what I'm hearing from you is like, you, you are, are, are um, investing locally for local products that you know will will help people in, you know, in the Maryland region. And, you know, I'd heard about Sagamore whiskey and I didn't know you were growing stuff for them. So that's really fun to hear. Yeah. Um, and it's also I was going to you know specifically ask you about Ag Prez and and what I'm interested in, and I don't know if you have the have the data, I imagine I hope the county does, as far as um, you know what proportion of the economics of Carroll County still rely on agriculture. So, you know, some time ago, I, I think it was Donald Dell set, set this hundred thousand dollar, hundred thousand acre, sorry, hundred thousand, yes. you know, preservation that, uh, threshold that that somehow would keep uh, you know, agricultural viable in, in Carroll County. And I'm just curious, you know, you, you're talking about the challenges around Finksburg is how, you know, uh, farms are being lost to development. Does it feel to you like Carroll County is on a trajectory where where agriculture will still be, you know, an, a, an important economic engine in this county? I hope so. To answer your question, I always hope so. Um, I think we're right around seventy or seventy-two thousand. Seventy-five. Seventy-five. <laughs> right. Okay, there you go. Well, we're going to have a seventy-five thousand so celebration this fall. So. See, you're more up to the actual number than I am. Um, but to get to the next 30,000 or 25,000 that we're going to need in preservation, we're going to have to probably look at adapting some new rules. Like when we first looked, it had to be uh, certain criteria on the farm, certain, you know, 100 acre blocks, things like that. I think there's a lot that we need to make sure that our other politicians besides my father are aware of that we might need to take smaller uh, acreages. You know, we might need to be looking. We cannot turn down everything that comes available. I'm really blessed that we're, we have a great guy um, that'll be starting in the Agland preservation business. He's a longtime farmer, great guy in New Windsor. His name's John Parker Smith. Uh, JP and I've known each other forever. 
I think we're really blessed to have a Carroll County farmer running or going to be running the Carroll County um, Ag Land Preservation Office. I know Ralph Robertson, when he was, was in there, did a phenomenal job of running it. Um, and, and I'm just, you know, I work with JP on farms that we're doing stuff with, and I'm just glad that we have someone in the office and in the county that are Maryland and better than just Maryland farmers, they're Carroll County farmers, and it's near and dear to their heart. So I do believe we'll hit our 25,000 acre goal. I think we just need to make <clears throat> politicians, local um, uh, decision makers more aware of how important ag land preservation still is in order to get to our 25,000 acre goal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know JP and, and I know Deborah Bowers, who, who's, you know, I think tomorrow, mm -hmm. last day. Um, and I, yeah. I'm really excited about having JP at the helm. Um, um, and I've also just heard that uh, the commissioners decided not to take money from the Ag Pres program, the county Ag Pres program, to fund other parts of the budget. So that's really good news. So I think in like open spaces, it's supposed to be fully, fully funded. So that money will be coming from the state and with the county funding, um, they should be able to acquire some really good properties because it's also my understanding that that there's a you know a pretty there's a queue of people wanting to participate in the program, which which I, I find uh, very heartening. Um, I would hope, and maybe you know, I'm hoping that this outfit can can facilitate this. Is that you know, that, like you said, you know, I think you know people move to this county and do the NIMBY thing. You know, they 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 enjoy the the agricultural rural character, but they may not understand what's what's entailed in making sure that that continues in the future. It's like just simply putting up with, um, you know, tractors and combines on the road, which I love to see, you know, every time I see that, it's like, yeah, you know, so, somebody's like out there producing. Um, and they, and even for me, you know, understanding the economics of like how that actually contributes to the county, to its well-being, to our quality of life. Um, so it's, it's really good to hear it from a farmer. <laughs> The, the one of the toughest obstacles most farmers <clears throat> and are facing is the fact most people let's face facts I get to talk around the country I can be very blunt mm -hmm. is the fact that most people think we uh, all wear biv overalls and we chew tobacco and we don't really know much however you know I'm the accountant I'm the decision maker um I have to make some pretty tough decisions throughout the entire day that can bankrupt our operation or not, you know, <clears throat> and I usually conclude with this when we're speaking nationally is when you become a sixth generation farmer, the thing a lot of people don't realize is the pressure that's on you outside of. What do I mean by that? Am I going to be the, am I going to be the generation that loses the family farm? Mm. Am I going to be the generation that can't keep it going from a bad decision? Is there going to be a drought that's going to bankrupt me? You know, and these are things people don't take in consideration. And, and as we're going out and we're speaking, we're also trying to educate. You know, <clears throat> we farm against some housing developments. I might stop the sprayer and I might be telling the people to, hey, you know, yes, Roundup is a carcinogen, but it's not going to kill you if you use it properly. OK, that means you don't stick your hand down in the jug and you don't eat a sandwich after spraying it. You know, where are the proper PPEs and these little things, you know, we have been spraying our whole life and we understand the fact that, you know, it is dangerous. Some of the herbicides we use and we need to be taking the proper PPEs and doing things and making sure that we're doing everything possible. However, you know, being the sixth generation farmer and a lot of the pressures there are guys that in the last year and the marketing and the COVID, uh, unfortunately, have taken their own lives. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, um, you know, I've lost several dear friends over the last few, um, over the last year. Uh, Blake Cobb was one of my dear friends from Indiana who the pressure of making the wrong decision put him in financial jeopardy. And a lot of farmers are too prideful to remember that there is something outside of the farm. And one of the things as we're, you know, you're driving down the road and you see the tractor, you don't always understand what's in that guy's head. 
as I don't understand what's in the guy driving the car's head. And, you know, there are a lot of decisions that are weighing on that guy. Is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain? Am I making the right decision? Is it going to get 31 degrees and I'm going to lose the crop that I planted two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are all decisions that weigh very heavy on young people in agriculture or the sixth generation farmer and, or the fourth generation farmer. I'm not just saying it from a sixth or it could be a ninth. You know, as I travel and I talk, I always just make everybody aware. You don't know what's in the guy driving the car's head as well as they don't know what's in the, the farmer and the, in the tractor, the combine, the large piece of machinery. Stop and just relax. It'll all work out at the end of the day. But there is more pressure on guys as we're getting generation to generation. Can I keep it going? Can I be the one to make sure that we're handling things? You know, that's why programs like preservation, the conservation programs at soil conser conservation are so important for agriculture and farming that we're aware of what we're doing. You know, <clears throat> I don't know any farmer off the top of my head who just wants to destroy their land and do a bad job, you know, to manure management down the line. So these are things like groups like yours and others. I feel that it's very important that you get out and you tell your local politicians, hey, you know, where do you stand on ag land preservation? One of my famous lines that I picked up from a guy who's very close to me, who's in politics, I'm not going to name names or say dad, but <laughs> one of his famous lines is, where do you see yourself in 10, 15 years? Okay. And I've, I've heard this over years. He's asked politicians when he went up and shook their hand and said, where do you see yourself? 10, 15 years. And I can remember one was running for a position. He said, oh, I see myself in Myrtle Beach in about 10, 15 years. And dad says, all right. And we walked away and I said to my father, I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm not going to vote for that guy because he's mm -hmm. not going to be here. Right. He wants to make decisions now that will impact me the rest of my life. And, and this is what's tough in this world. I mean, <clears throat> so that's why I always am a big advocate for the preservation, for the conservation programs, not, you know, one over the other. I know there needs to be smart growth and we need to always be growing and building a bigger infrastructure for everything. So, <laughs> you know, one hand feeds the other in my personal opinion. So. Very good. Diana, Mark. Are, are Mike? we... Are we in danger of losing more farmland in the Pinksburg area, or has it mostly been preserved what's left? I see a lot of development going on. I've seen a lot of development. I can't, <clears throat> I don't know that statistic. That's a, that's a JP kind of question. I don't know what's planned or what's not. I mean, but yes, I mean, we're always faced with development. I mean, I don't hear farmers expanding as much as what you used to. You hear them, you know, some farmers are going or retiring and other people farm their land, but you hear more of the when they pass their kids get a hold of it and they just want to sell it it's too much of a burden i don't want to deal with it well ag land preservation and what you can afford is one thing and a developer sees 85 to 100 lots he can pay a lot more so you know these are where unfortunately pro progress changes what we're doing so I can't answer that 100% just to the Finksburg area. I can talk more countywide on that. Yeah, it just, it just seems like the, the county's given up on the Finksburg Hampstead area and just, yeah, go ahead, just plant houses everywhere, you know, kind of crazy. And that's why I think it's very important with JP coming in. I think he's going to have a more focus on the Finksburg area as well as the Hampstead area. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Chris, when does, he, when does he start that role? I hope Monday morning. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Yeah, the current administrator is retiring, I think, Sissy said tomorrow. Yeah. So I'm hoping he kind of takes in that role. Um, I always feel that that's a role that needs to be handled by a farm. And, and I'm really looking forward to having him in that role. I think he'll bring a lot of the same values that Ralph Robertson brought. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the county can be real proud, I think, you know, of their, uh, you know, history of ag land preservation, because I mean, we're, we're definitely uh, one of the best in the states or the best in the state and nationally we rank really high. And I think the county is really going to benefit 
in the long run from being proactive and doing the ag land preservation. Uh, Cause you know, cause Lord knows what the future is gonna bring, but there, there's part of me that that's kind of suspects that our, our um, um, you know, the, the way we're doing agriculture right now on, uh, not around here, but like, you know, in the Midwest and stuff where you're, or, or even in the Amazon where you're converting, you know, large tracts of rainforest to, uh, raise cattle and soybeans, that that's, that's not going to be sustainable, that at some point, you know, you're going to have to pull back and look at the, the, the smaller acreages and do like what you were talking about, where, you know, you focus your attention on, you know, high yielding soils and, and making those as productive as you can. Uh, that I, I think that that's, personally, I think that's where our future is going to be. Work, I'm currently working on a few projects right now in South Africa, and those are where we're taking some ground that are out of production agriculture and bringing them back in. I'm uh, very blessed to be working very close with a gentleman named Danny Bester in South Africa, and we're actually re reclaiming unused ground and bringing it back into ag, pres or ag production <clears throat> in his area right now. So there are alternative ideas and we're, we're looking at how we can, I guess, reclamate soils in different areas of the, of the world. So, you know, that that's one that we're looking at. I'm also working on a project in Brazil as, as we speak okay. on how we're going to uh, reclaim some areas down there as well. I don't share all the secrets that we're doing in the United States, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we have to be thinking, unfortunately, anymore in agriculture, you better be thinking globally mm -hmm. and not just in a 50 mile an hour, 50 mile radius. Um, yeah. it, it's really funny as I travel throughout the country, how many people know me, how many people know somebody that is one of my neighbors. You know, it's really in agriculture, it's a small world or the United States is really small when you get out there and you start talking to guys and you know, as we're growing, I, you know, a buddy of mine, Matt Miles in Arkansas, we come to find out a few weeks ago, we had the same grain broker, you know, and he's in Missouri. So it's a very small world in agriculture. And that's one of the big things where I always tell everybody, quit thinking locally and just be thinking worldwide. And we better because of a lot of the trade issues, a lot of the things that we're seeing that China can control. Yeah, it's very true. That's very true. We need to take care of ourselves for sure. Figure out a way to do it. Okay, Chris, Sissy, Mark, Diana, Mike. I'd just like to say I hope we can uh, follow up in this conversation uh, in the future. You know, let some of this information percolate. <laughs> um, like, you know, actually, yeah, so I'd like to talk to you sometime about, you know, your reclamation of degraded lands, you know, what kind, what, what the degradation is, because I, I have done some work in, in uh, land use and land mapping, and that's on a global scale, and uh, mm -hmm. degradation of rangelands is, uh, it was a hot topic at the University of Maryland when I was still working there, so I'd be, I'd be interested mm -hmm. in hearing how that's going, and that there, yeah, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of issues facing agriculture, you know, you know, trade is part of it, uh, but, you know, how we're using land and, you know, what, what uh, contributes to the degradation. Our water distribution is not going to be the same as it has been historically. So our water supplies, you know, uh, weather patterns are shifting, snowpacks are melting. So we're going to have a lot of challenges. And you're right about being global. I mean, you know, right. Right, you know, uh, what is it? Think globally, act local, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, and Chris, thank you. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Uh, you know, I, I'm certain you know of our organization, what we do and how we gather and what we're trying to do in terms of protecting and, and inspiring the Finksburg area, whatever that may mean. But at any rate, we have a vested interest in the well being of this area as well. And I think we have a lot of similar thoughts in that regard to what you were sharing tonight. So I, I just like to leave an open invitation. I mean, I really did enjoy um, hearing everything that you were talking about this evening. It just provides a different perspective on, on what's taking place in your world for sure. But I'd like to leave an open invitation. If you'd like to ever address us again with any sort of updates, 
particularly anything that's relevant to the Finksburg area where we might be able to help out um, in regard to anything that's uh, of value to our territory here in Carroll County. We'd, we'd love to have, mm -hmm. love to hear from you, certainly love to have you back and, and talk at any time. Anytime, Skip, I look forward to it. Great, very good. Okay, thank any you. other questions in for Chris before we leave? No, just thank you very much, Chris. I really appreciate you taking the time. It was really good. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Very good. Thanks again, Chris. All right. Thank good night, you. everybody. Hey, good night. Good night.